Heads, episode 112, and I've got a special guest with me this week, as I do most weeks, but uh, this is a returning guest. You guys have heard him before, and it's our buddy from Sage Dynamics, Aaron Cowan. Aaron, welcome in, buddy. Hey, man. Good to be here. So, it's been a while since you've been on. Now, we've actually uh, seen each other at a couple of events since the last time you were on, but uh, our audience hasn't had an opportunity to to catch up with you. So uh, we're going to do that a little bit later in the show. For right now, let's do what we did this week in guns. All right, so this week I haven't had an opportunity to do a lot with, with firearms, but we, as you know from the last show, uh, there's a group here in Murfreesboro, and, and since the show they've actually named themselves. It's called Operation Warrior Guard. And this is a group of citizens, uh, former military, law enforcement, some still active duty, that have come together to stand guard for our military at our local military recruiting offices. Of course, you know, we, we talked about it last week. Some of the people that around the nation have been doing it irresponsibly. But our group has been real tight and real responsible with how they're doing it. We've got the community behind us. We've got the property owners behind us. The recruiters there are behind us 100%. The law enforcement haven't had any problems out of uh, anybody. A couple of people, you know, come by occasionally, negative things to say. But for the most part, it's just been overwhelmingly still a lot of good positive support that we get from our community. The main guy, Tim Guy, which was on the show last week, is actually today, which is um, which day, Thursday, is going to be on one of the local news channels uh, doing an interview. So I'll be mm-hmm. posting some of that to our Facebook page later today, maybe tomorrow, whenever they get it cut and put out. Uh, I have been working on some of those videos that I told you about from the machine gun shoot that I went to in Ohio. And the drone that was there, I think I mentioned that it had a FLIR infrared camera on it. And I got the footage back from that yesterday, and I'm cutting that into the videos. The first one I'm going to release is a shooting a 50 cal, Barrett 50 cal, and the heat on that barrel after the first shot, I mean, you don't see it at all in the, in the first uh, couple of clips. And then after that first shot, it's just orange. It just turns <laughs> bright orange. It's awesome. And then we've got a shot of the actual round hitting the steel target. And you can see the burst of heat, uh, the kinetic energy. Once that round hits that metal, uh, it's pretty cool video, so I should have that out hopefully here within uh, the next couple of days as well. So, Aaron, what have you been up to? Well, uh, for my weekend guns, uh, let's see, I guess if we go ahead and go back to Saturday, I did a, uh, a simunitions class on Saturday here in Atlanta, and then uh, just got started on a 2,000-round review of that new Gemtex suppressor adjustable bolt carrier group. Finished filming a review on that new Surefire Fury and Telebling flashlight. Tell us a little bit about that uh, flashlight. Well, it's it's uh, it's actually kind of a I, – I like it a lot. It's now my everyday carry flashlight. But basically, it's it's the same body style as, as the Fury, for those that are familiar with the Fury. It's a one-inch body. It's got like a 1.37-inch bezel. It's your standard hand size flashlight. Uh, right. Two batteries, the, the three volts. And it's got the double-tap capability, just like most of Surefire's other flashlights. But the first setting is 15 to 600 lumens based on distance from the object that the light is hitting. So if you're really far away from an object, you're going to get that maximum 600 lumens. But as you get closer, the light automatically dims. Which oh, that's for, cool. For someone who doesn't have a lot of low light training or doesn't know how to work a light in conjunction with a handgun, or even if you're just using the light you know, for administrative purposes, like you're looking for your dog or you've lost your keys in the lawn or something like that, it automatically dims the light for you. So you're not going to get a lot of backsplash out of, off of objects and ruin your night vision. Right. So, uh, and if you need, you know, if you have to use a light to control somebody or something like that, you double tap it. It just gives you a constant 600 lumens, which, you know, some people are like, oh, I don't like the fact that I have to double tap it to to go to 600, but that's no different than Surefire's other lights where they have like a low and a high setting. So, right. um, The light can't tell the difference between a person and a wall. It just knows distance. So it dims automatically based on distance. So if you need to use it for control, you just double tap it just like you would any other light. Right. I like it a lot. I would think that it would uh, help prolong your battery life also by it having oh, those definitely, automatic definitely. settings. Yeah. That's an awesome, awesome yeah. piece of kit. Yeah, I like that. And the, 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 that I don't remember what the retail price is on them, but it's not that bad. I mean, you're paying for Surefire, but 
What was the uh, the other video you said you were working on prior to that? Uh, the Gym Tech Suppressor Bolt Carrier Group. Yeah, tell us about that. Well, I first encountered this thing back at SHOT Show in January. Uh, I got hands on one in February, and I was able to do an informational video, which is already on my YouTube channel. There's an informational video on there where I basically just introduce it, talk about what it is, but I didn't have time to review it. So I was just I just shot a video saying, hey, this is cool, this exists, this is coming out. But Gym Tech didn't get them on the market until last month, like late last month. So I finally was able to, to get a review going. And the whole idea behind it is when it comes to suppressing uh, the AR platform, you have all that gas getting kicked back into the gun, and it tends to make the gun run hotter and dirtier. You know, obviously the advantages of suppressing a rifle is, you know, hearing attenuation and recoil control. But you got all that gas coming back in the gun. So people have done adjustable gas blocks and they've done gas busting charging handles. But no one's ever, until now, that I'm aware of, gone to the bolt carrier group and tried to find a solution there. So the Gym Tech has two settings. It's got suppressed and unsuppressed. Mm -hmm. They take it out of the gun, you turn a little screw, a little, little half turn, put it back in the gun. And now on the suppressed setting, it vents all the gas out of the ejection port. So you can get your, like I got my suppressor up to right just below 500 degrees and the bolt carrier group is sitting right at like 140. So it's keeping oh. a lot of the heat from resonating inside the gun itself, which is really good. Cause once that, you know, you add carbon and then you start baking at two, 300 degrees, you're going to have a filthy gun really, really quick. Right. But I like it a lot cause it, you know, keeps the gas out of my face and uh, it lets the gun run cooler than it normally would. The heat mainly just stays up front. Yeah. How long have you been running it? Uh, I've got, I think I've got 400 rounds through right now. I'm taking it to 2,000. So. Okay. Yeah, so it's fairly new for you then. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, the funny thing is the uh, when I did the deal with PWS, I did a Sage Dynamics Edition direct contender PWS rifle. They all shipped with the Gym Tech Suppressor Bolt Carriers. Um, nice. That's one of the options that I added to it. But this will be the first time I've actually reviewed one. Mm-hmm. How long have you had that rifle out? Uh, that rifle came out in May. Uh, okay. We got a few left. Uh, it was just a limited run. Oh, well, talk talk about that uh, for people who may not know about that and may want one if you still have some available. Well, it was it was basically just I wanted to do uh, you know I was approached and asked if I wanted to do a Sage Dynamics rifle and I, I decided through asset weapon manufacturing out of Oklahoma to do a limited run where there's only going to be X number of guns and I already use PWS. I trust PWS. I like PWS stuff, so I decided to do a PWS direct impingement. Uh, which PWS is known for the piston guns, but they do offer direct impingement guns, like they have the modern musket edition. Um, so I decided to go with the DI version, and basically I just added the features that I like on a gun. So it went with a CMC single stage 3.5 trigger. It's got the Jim Specs pressure bolt carry group. It's got a Cryptek type and finish with the Sage logo on it. Sweet. Uh, and I tried to keep the price as low as I could, but I like quality stuff. So my rifles are probably going to be a little bit more expensive than what some people would consider like an intermediate range. Right. I tried to keep it under two thousand uh, dollars. It came out at twenty one hundred. There's just no avoiding that. But in order to give back to the purchasers, anybody who buys a rifle gets three comps rifle classes. So, oh wow! That's yeah. so. I mean, for the quality that's going into that gun with those parts that you've got on it, twenty one hundred dollars. I mean, really, is not that bad. And then no, you're it's th not. It's you're throwing those classes in on top of that. Mm -hmm. Which those classes are probably what anywhere from five hundred to twelve hundred dollars a piece, something like that. Uh, they're all the one day classes, so oh okay, getting, gotcha. you're getting about seven hundred dollars worth of training just uh, for for purchasing the rifle. That's awesome. Um, you know, and that definitely removes a roadblock for some people because most people their 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 aversion to training is either the cost of the training, the cost of the ammunition, or the cost of traveling to the course, or all three combined. So. You know, I think that's what all gun manufacturers should do is when, is, you know, like for the first time gun buyer mm -hmm. is throw in there. Cause you know, they'll like you buy today or especially as you get extra magazines or you get, you know, this case and magazines and a hat and a bag and a, man, they ought to throw in some training because no, that's, no. that's what people need. It makes the most sense. And there's a lot of trainers out there that would be willing to partner with rifle companies and do that. I mean, yeah. Rifle companies, handgun companies, both. And most rifle companies have people on staff that are instructors or have taught in the past who can definitely teach the platform. Right. So I don't. It's it's one of those things I don't really I don't really get it. 
Like some companies, like SIG like has SIG Arms Academy, but they don't pair the SIG Arms Academy with SIG products. So you can't buy a new P320 and then get a free handgun class. Right. You know, and that's, that's the big bitch and gripe and moan is that, you know, people that own these firearms, you know, aren't properly trained. No, what, what trained better, at yeah, or trained at all. What better way to do that than these manufacturers throw in a certificate for training, you know, pair up with the local uh, instructors and throw in a certificate for, you know, a couple of training classes. Well, I mean that, that right there just seems too simple to me. Yeah. And it's definitely something I'd like to see. I think, I think it would resonate really well with, with the shooting public because the, especially for the rifle market, the, the, at least from my impression right now, the existing market is an entry level gun. Well, after the 2013 scare, the $600 AR is a thing of the past. So, mm-hmm. You're seeing the entry level guns right around seven, eight hundred bucks, and guys' solution to that is just to build their own gun. Well, if you've never built an AR before, you, you're you're in for a treat. Yeah, um, <laughs> I can but, tell you from experience. Yeah. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. It's enough small parts to fury, uh, to infuriate a watchmaker, um, <laughs> especially putting in those roll pins. But well, not only that, but the tools you need to have. You well, know, yeah, you're, you're in, for some people, it's going to be a one-time purchase. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you're not getting a warranty. Um, you're not getting anything specced. You're just kind of eyeing things and putting it together. And some people don't even check their head spacing, which if you've got a good made chamber and in a bulk carry group, you probably don't have to worry about head spacing, but you still should check it. Always want to check your head spacing. Yeah. I check head spacing on every gun I buy, every gun that comes into me for review. I mean, I bought some head spacing gauges from Brownells like 10 years ago, and they're going to last forever because they're made out of solid metal. But yeah, it, 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 with the market the way it is, I think if, if a company wanted to, you know, kind of incentivize a new rifle purchase, offering one training class would be mm-hmm. would be huge. Sure. Um, now I don't know how that would work on the back end because instructors are a business just like anything else. You know, if I could if I could teach for free, I would, but there's, it just doesn't make sense. I have bills to pay. Yeah, sure, absolutely. I try to keep my training costs as low as possible. Uh, I still think I have some of the the, the most inexpensive simunitions types courses out there, which usually run maybe four or five, six hundred dollars for for a day of training. Right. Um, but they could work with the you know the instructor on the back end and figure out how the deal would work, and then you know. it's simple. I mean, what they do is because the, they build all this other stuff into the price of the gun. That's they say it's free, but it, you know you're still paying for it. Um, at the same time, they could build these certificates in either to the price of the gun or it's a discount. You know, it's a mm-hmm. it's a certificate for a discount to go and and do the training with you know this particular well, individual. They, off as the the they could do that as well, and you know, I don't know why groups like the NRA wouldn't get behind something like this because that's their whole thing is you know gun responsibility owner you know responsible owners. Yeah, um, the NRA is really skittish about training. If you look at the NRA civilian side and you look at the NRA's law enforcement side, the NRA law enforcement training is amazing. Uh, they, they provide really good training. It's cutting edge. It's constantly evolving. It's not stagnant at all. Uh, then you look at the civilian side and it's, it's nothing's changed for 10, 15 years. Like they keep teaching the same things. Like they're still they're not still evolving the, the, the five step double feed clearance on the handgun. And I'm like, I no, don't, don't do that. You don't know. There's too many steps. Like you're, you're complicating things. Yeah. And granted on the scale of things that are going to happen to you, a double feed is way down the line uh, in, in the more or less likely scenario. Mm-hmm. But if you're going to teach it, let's teach the most efficient way possible. Um, and I've talked to people who work directly with the NRA and they were doing NRA type stuff and they got complaints about uh, the NRA had a problem with them having a, a light on their handgun during the filming. They didn't want it on, on the gun. And this person was like, "Are you are you serious? Like that doesn't make any sense. Like this is this is how my handgun is set up." They're like, "Yeah, right. but we don't we're not getting into that tactical stuff." <laughs> tactical. <laughs> and I'm like, "Light is common sense." The light. Well, it is. It is tactical. You know, we we had a sec- segment on this on our show one time about what tactical is. I'm tactically dressed right now for what I'm doing. Yeah. You know, I've oh, got on. Sh- lost all meaning. It it has. Yeah. You know it. By, by definition, a light is tactical based on the situation in which you're, you're going to use it. But that word, like it's it's not even a buzzword anymore. It's it's a cliche now. Right. So yeah, I just that's something that we ought to we ought to start maybe looking into to with these gun manufacturers and you know the, the different organizations, gun organizations is 
working out some sort of a training program along with the purchase of the gun. I think that would be that makes a lot of sense. revolutionary. Get more than one instructor on board with that. I would think so because it's just going to lead to – because after, like me, once I took my first class, I, I wanted to take more and more and more and more. I didn't, yeah. I didn't actually realize what I didn't know. You know, you don't know what you don't know. Mm-hmm. And I, that, I was in that category where I didn't know what I didn't know until I took the class, and then that just led to so much more that now I know what I don't know, and I need to correct that. Well, you got the, the levels of confidence, and, and once you realize you're incompetent, I mean, confidence is not a bad word. Um, people people make it out to be a bad word. Now, if you're consciously incompetent, that's or negligently incompetent, that, like you need to know how yeah. to do something, and you just choose not to. Now, now, confidence becomes a bad word. You're incompetent. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, that's how training happens. Somebody takes their first training class. Once they get over those mental hurdles of why they they make excuses for why they shouldn't train, they take that first class, and it's like, wow, I need I need more of this. Hmm. Um, you know, and I think if, you know, we recognize in our natural light and self-defense, we're using firearms for our natural light and self-defense because that's a great equalizer. Uh, and people say, you know, I'm taking personal responsibility for my own life. Some people just stop there. They think, well, I own the gun, so I'm good. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then yeah. they take one class and they realize how much they don't know and how much, like, how, I guess you could say how far behind the power curve they are. Right. Because, you know what, I don't, I don't want to go overboard with this, but I definitely need to take more classes. Yeah. And that's the way I was... Once I, you know, I bought my first handgun and I thought that, you know, I could, I could defend myself or take care of myself and others in any situation. I was like, cause I, just cause I got a gun mm. until I took my first class. I didn't realize how dead I would have been if I ever had an altercation, if an altercation ever came up or how dead some other people might've been because of my, my, um, my ignorance. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, you've got, you've got to go beyond your, your carry certificate. You, you know, in some states don't even require basic training for a, for a CCW. Yeah. We were talking about that a couple of shows ago too. Like Maine, I think they just evoked a law that you don't have to get a permit to carry. Yeah. Yeah. Which I mean, and Arizona is that way. I think is in Arizona that way. I believe so. It, it comes down to like a personal responsibility issue. I, I believe as a gun over, you have a moral and an ethical requirement to be as well trained as you possibly can be based on what it is you expect to encounter. So for basic self-defense, like it's more than just standing in a stall and, and shooting a ragged, you know, shot group at, at three, five, seven, ten 10 meters. Uh, mm-hmm. You need to know the physical techniques as well. I mean, I don't expect everybody to be, you know, like high speed ninja, but if, you can't run a, a firearm under stress, and it's more importantly than that, if you don't know how to utilize movement, clearing angles, verbal verbal skills, flashlight, if you don't know what to do before, what to do after, if you don't know conflict avoidance, uh, then you're doing yourself a huge disservice, and you might end up in a situation where you had to use your firearm because you didn't know how to prevent the situation, how to prevent from using the firearm. Yeah, yeah. Let's uh, let's get into our jack wagon now. Uh, that's sure. kind of a good set. It'll kind of lead into to one of the jack wagons that you wanted to talk about there. So, Arlie Ermy, take it away. Hey, Ralph, Semper Fi, do or die, hold them high at 8th and I. It is time for the Talking Lead Jack Wagon of the Week, so brace yourself, baby. All right, so, Aaron, we were talking a little bit uh, beforehand, and we've got several people that were, you know, kind of debating on who to throw on. And of course, one of them is is Obama, and he's he's on there. He's got a permanent seat on our jack wagon train, but it just and I don't know why I'm surprised every time I, I see a story or read an article about you know the latest thing that he said. But recently, uh, he did a, an interview with I think it was BBC, and he made a statement to the effect that says Americans having guns is worse than Islamic terrorism. I, I don't know what to say about that, but well, it's, it's not surprising at all for, for two reasons. One, I mean, I don't think he's ever been, he's ever been one to be shy about how he feels about our, you know, second amendment, right. Uh, but two, he's always been more open with his real feelings when he does interviews with media. That's not based in the United States. Right. He's yeah, willing to, and and he's speaking to a, to a different audience in that interview. He's speaking to people who that might resonate more with because you're looking at a population of people, especially in the United Kingdom, that they've been disarmed for quite some time. Right, they've been neutered for a while. 
And that's a totally, you know, different different yeah. topic. But he's speaking to an audience, at least as far as people who would be willing to listen to him, who that's going to resonate with them. They're going to be like, oh, yeah, that makes total sense. We're in the U.S. We're like, is this a numbers game? Is it a competition? Like, we need bodies. We need a body. Yeah, right. On side, and he doesn't factor well, his His actual quote was, uh, and this is according to the, an article, and I'll tell you where it's at that I'm reading this. It's the Daily Headlines. Dailyheadlines.net, 2015, 07, Obama says Americans having guns is worse than Islamic terrorism. So if you want to f- Google that, wow. um, is he says, if you look at the number of Americans killed since 9-11 by terrorism, it's less than 100. If you look at the number that have been killed by gun violence, it's in the tens of thousands. Now, you know, obviously he's just making a broad statement with broad facts. He's not chiseling down that, okay, of those tens of thousands, how many of those, like you were saying, were criminal acts? Yeah. Which is more than likely going to be. Or justified homicide, self defense situations. My other, my yeah. other issue is, yeah. is what is the definition of terrorism? Because, I mean, we had Nadal Hassan, who shot up Fort Hood, and they classified that as workplace violence. Uh, Which so, is is complete bullshit. I mean, that's well, that's yeah. terrorism. I mean, you, that's, me and you agree on that. But if you're a low information citizen, if you don't really pay attention to politics and you don't pay attention to the gun rights fight and you don't pay attention to things like that, and you hear like, oh, workplace violence, the terrorism side of that thing may not even factor into you if you're so low information that you don't even know what Al Qaeda is, you don't know what ISIS is. You're like, you know what, I don't have time for that in my life. You know, there's a new episode of the Keep It Up the Kardashians coming on. So <laughs> those are the people that he's reaching out to, and that's gonna, that's gonna, they're gonna resonate with that. Be like, oh yeah, he's really serious. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and it goes back to what we were talking about uh, on a couple of shows earlier: is critical thinking in this country does not exist anymore. People do not think for themselves. They take take anything that comes out of their uh their hero you know their role model's mouth as fact rather than questioning that to an extent to to go and actually dig and research to to find the numbers or the the, see if that statement's actually true yeah you should you should trust someone you know trust certain people but you should also verify on your own because if someone throws out a fact and they call it a fact, and this is a fact, and they say it. Uh, you see this in firearms classes all the time. Instructor will say, you know, this, you know, this is the statistically, this is the distance you're going to get in your gunfight at. You know, I'm going to take issue with that because I'm like, okay, well, where are you getting those numbers from? And then I'm going to be all up on the internet trying to find out where those numbers came from if he doesn't know. And if he doesn't know, I take issue with the fact that he's repeating the information. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I'll, I'm, and by looking for that information, I'm going to learn all these other things I didn't intend to learn. You know, yeah. I set out for this goal, and I'm going to learn so much stuff along the way, and it's going to take me 20 minutes. Yeah. So, so terrorist. You know, what is the meaning of terrorist? You know, someone who, you know, evokes fear uh, or tries to get you violence or intimidation to reach a political goal. There you go. And the gangs that are in this country are they not terrorist? Is it? Well, yeah. Is that I what think they do. Definitely- classify them that way depending on whose definition of terrorism you're going to use but like terrorism you said that guy the guy that shot up the the recruiters you know yeah. was that uh, terrorism i think it was terrorism that so was terrible well, what about them. what about the guy in the uh the most recent movie theater shooting was that not terrorism i would classify it as terrorism yeah i don't know what his goal was but to me motive is usually irrelevant uh, you know like everybody gets wrapped around with the why and i'm mm-hmm. I mean, it's important from an academic standpoint, but is understanding the why going to help you prevent the next shooting? Yeah. Good, depending on what the motivation was. Right. Now, you need to find out what the core root was because they could execute their act of violence, use, you know, force with a car. You know, they don't need a gun. They could do it with a knife. They could do it with a bat. You know, more people are bludgeoned to death than they are shot. Obama, you just secured your seat on the jack wagon train for infinity. (laughs) <laughs> so I don't know if you guys have put put Mr. Bernie Sanders on the jack wagon train yet, but I'd like to go ahead and get him a seat up near the front. No, yeah, yeah. Let's put it. He's not on there yet. Let's put him on. Yeah, well, Bernie, old Bernie, he's the apparently he's the grassroots favorite Democratic candidate. Um, he's he's the big, you know, the, the supposedly the, the Democratic underdog for our upcoming uh, election. Mm-hmm. And he did a uh, interview on Meet the Press where he said that, and I quote. 
nobody should have a gun who's, who has a criminal background, which I agree with. Uh, who's involved in domestic abuse situations? Okay. People should not have guns who are going to hurt other people who are unstable. And second of all, I believe that we need to make sure that certain types of guns used to kill people exclusively, not for hunting, they should not be sold in the United States of America. And we have a huge loophole now with gun shows that should be on. Uh, my biggest issue with that is he brings up the hunting thing again. And uh, yeah, the and the loophole thing about the hunting or sporting purposes that comes from the basically the, the, the GCA that comes from the Gun Control Act. I believe it was from the 1986 Gun Control Act where they said sporting or hunting purposes. And the NRA kind of laid down on that one and let it roll over. Different conversation. Uh, but yeah. that's where that term comes from. It doesn't exist in case law or any kind of lexicon before. 1986. So they keep using hunting or sporting purposes as this regulatory ability to just say, well, that gun doesn't seem to serve a sporting or a hunting purpose. So I'm going to go ahead and we don't need it. Now, Bernie is going to run for president and he's got a chance. I don't know how good his chance is, but he has a chance of becoming our next president. Hopefully it doesn't happen. Uh, Nobody named Bernie is going to be our president. Yeah, I, I, I sincerely hope so, because the last thing we need is another anti-gun president, so we'd be going into yeah. another four, potentially eight years of a president who's going to continue to assault the second. And Name, named tired, Bernie. I'm tired of politicians telling us what we can't do with an amendment that tells the government what it can't do. Right. The second amendment exists to tell the government, you're not allowed to do this, and they're continually encroaching on it every chance they get. So my idea is if we're going to go with that hunting or sporting purposes, then all we have to do is invent a sport that requires uh, the rifle to be used in the sport to cancel out all these NFA restrictions. So this sport basically requires you to have a short-barreled, fully automatic rifle with a collapsible stock. And because that now has a sporting purpose, it's completely legal. Yep. Now, I don't know if that's going to work, but I think it's a cool idea. Yeah. But I, just, I don't want somebody, to, somebody telling me what I can and can't do named Bernie either. <laughs> well, I issue with his name because he didn't pick it. His parents chose that. Yeah, but he could. You know, he's he's a grown man. He could have changed it. He could be Bernard. Well, and, and, yeah. and if you read into the guy and actually see what he's all about, he's he's. I don't know, I don't know how familiar you are with Ann Rand, but he's like this two dimensional Ann Rand villain. He's uh, all about stealing from the rich and giving to the poor, uh, which is awesome in theory if you're that kind of guy. But I personally, I like people to earn what they have. Um, that's what I've done. Yeah, so. absolutely. Now he he he's one of those flip flop kind of guys too. Because wasn't he a Republican at one point, and he actually voted against the Brady Act? I want to say yeah. I'm, I'm I don't quote me on that, but I think you're right. Yeah, it seems like I read something about that. Yeah, uh, yeah, somewhere. Yeah, uh, I think yeah. Back in '93, he voted against the Brady Act. Yeah, um, and now he's you know. And he supported bills to allow firearms and checked baggage on Amtrak trains and block funding to any foreign aid organization that registered or taxed American guns. Look at him. Uh, it, yeah. He changed his tune for political reasons. Imagine that. Yeah, exactly. So it just goes to show you, I mean, these power-hungry money grabbers will do anything to keep their, their control of, of – well, jeez, I mean, he's running for president. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> we don't want this guy in, in any kind of power whatsoever. No. So welcome to the jack wagon train, Bernie. <laughs> <laughs> so Aaron, get us caught up on what Sage Dynamics has been doing lately. I know you guys are offering some new classes. So tell us a, tell us a little bit about those. Well, the newest offering um, on the simunition side of the house is I've taken my low light rifle and low light handgun into two day classes because you really and the home defense class they're all two day classes now because you just can't cover all that content in one day so if people are going to come to a class they're going to get one day of practical exercise and then day two is going to be nothing but scenarios where they go force on force with real life people wearing the safety gear shooting the simulations um, but another thing i'll be doing really soon is uh, night vision classes and the cool thing about the night vision classes is you do not have to own or borrow or rent night vision equipment it will be provided. Really? Someone will register for the class, and they'll show up, and we will give them a, uh, a helmet with a dual PVS-14 mount system, so they have dual night vision, and then a PEC-15 or a D-ball, or a D-ball PL for the handgun um, for their personal firearm. Um, we'll get it set up, we'll get it zero during the day, and then we'll proceed through the actual training course, where they'll get to, they'll get to do some, you know, 
quote unquote high speed night vision uh, training stuff. That's one awesome. Biggest, yeah, one of the biggest problems in night vision classes is uh, a lot of the people who offer them, you know, they provide great night vision content, but you have to have night vision. Uh, you have to show up with your own night vision. Right. So, uh, so you guys will have all the necessary night vision equipment yes, there. All they need to do is provide themselves in their their firearms. Yeah. How are you guys able to do that? I mean, that's got to be expensive as hell. Well, there is obviously an expense to it. Um, I'm partnered up with a company out in Oklahoma that's assisting me in providing the night vision equipment. Um, and it's basically, you know, it's an investment just like anything else. I have a, I, I invested a lot of money in my simunitions equipment. You know, there's, one of the reasons you don't see more simunitions instructors is the equipment, the initial cost for all the simunitions, conversion kits, and all the safety gear is pretty, pretty, pretty steep depending on how many kits you get. Right. Uh, and night vision is no different. Obviously, night vision is significantly more expensive. You know, a really good high quality PBS 14 is going to run you between $2,500 and $4,000. And that's just with a green phosphor tube. If you wanted to get into amber phosphor or white phosphor tubes, you're going to spend even more money. Oh, Lord, yeah. Mm-hmm. But if someone, you know, has, they're saving up the money because they feel like they need night vision for, you know, their personal or professional reasons, this provides them the opportunity to, you know, check it out and see if it's something they really want, really need. So they, they can run a class without having to invest the money in the night vision and then mm-hmm. make that decision and a more intelligent decision, more informed decision saying, you know what, this is something I should probably have just in case. So if you're, you know, if you're, a, 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 I guess, a prepper minded person, having night vision can't hurt. And who doesn't like seeing in the dark? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And you don't need night vision just, you know, for your, for your guns is night vision is just cool to have anyway. Yeah. I mean, and it can be definitely very, a, a very useful tool depending on what kind of environment you live in or, or, you know, what you do for a living or, or things of that nature. And on the other side of it, you know, some people train just deep in toms. <laughs> yeah. 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 They have their team Wendy helmet. Um, yeah. So if, if you want to just take a class that's going to be informative, educational and entertaining, you know, it's going to provide a little bit of excitement in your life. Uh, this is definitely something you could pursue. And then you don't have to put a lot of money in up front to take no, the class. You're going to pay for the ammunition, you know, what you shoot. You're going to pay for the, obviously the course fee, and then you're going to pay for any kind of transportation or lodging or anything, but you don't have to yeah. spend like, okay. I'm no, you're going to, you're going to have your normal fees. It's just, yeah. Yeah. You, you don't have to have the additional fee of buying your, yeah, your you night vision equipment. Brand on night vision before you come take a class. Yeah. Hell yeah. That's awesome, man. So give us an idea of just a basic course outline for that. What, what else are going to entail? What you do is you're going to learn a little bit about the history of night vision, which is kind of academic and information, uh, but it's good to know so you know the limitations and the advantages of the system. Then you're going to learn how to function the night vision correctly. You're going to learn all about IR. Um, you're going to basically zero your pack or your D-ball uh, on the rifle. You're going to learn how to, to shoot with night vision. Um, starting out real slow, real basic, because the biggest problem in night vision is there's no near focus. So reloading is something you have to do almost intuitively, because all you see is the gun, the rifle, is a blur. You can't actually put close focus on it. So reloading techniques like that on night vision definitely complicate things. Uh, and then you're going to learn how to navigate, move, recognize, you know, depth perception issues and things of that nature, and then get into um, a lot of shooting, picking up speed as we go along. Um, so it'll start out, you know, real slow, real basic, and, and by the end of the course, you'll be able to effectively move and deliver really good fire uh, using night vision. Very cool. Is that a two-day course, you said? Yeah. Okay, that'd be a two-day. Uh, now, you've got that in, in place now, and it's ready to go. Is that correct? Or is well, that something that's coming up? Well, yeah, it's coming up. We're about 90%. We haven't announced our first date yet. Okay. One of the biggest hurdles you have with any kind of night training is finding ranges where you can shoot at night. Um, yeah. Some ranges allow you to shoot up until like 10 or 11 o'clock, which is great in the winter, but it's not so cool in the summertime. That's not a lot of darkness. So for a night vision course, we need to be able to run until three or four in the morning. And that's one of the things we're looking at now is finding ranges um, in as many states as possible where we can just pack up the gear and go and not have to really worry about it. Uh, but it's not as easy as one would think. Really cool class, the night vision course. I can't wait till you get that all ironed out and get the specifics because that's one that I definitely would love to take. Uh, another one that I, you know, I keep threatening to come down there and take, but I haven't yet <laughs> is the, is your simunitions class. I've, I've had a couple of friends that have gone down there and taken some classes with you. And they said that they're you know, really good, very informative, and they learned a lot. 
I definitely want to get down there and take that. Now you were telling me earlier, you know, we we're talking about that flashlight, but you've got some some flashlight use that you've integrated in with the course, right? Well, I have like on the simulation side of the house, I have a uh, low light rifle and low light handgun. And that allows people to train under simunitions using handheld lights, weapon mounted lights, working inside of buildings, inside of rooms, parking lots, things like that, uh, because it gets dark every single day. Uh, and you can always find yourself in a situation during the day where you're in an environment where there is no light. I mean, you think about the average parking garage, you can get in certain places where a handheld light would definitely come in handy. Yeah. Well, most criminals operate most criminals operate in yeah. low light situations they like the low light i mean if you think darkness is always concealment if you have enough darkness you are concealed um, so i used to teach the simunitions low light classes as a one day class and it, it there's just so much data you know we were running over you know it'd be an 8 hour class but we'd be there 12 hours so i've made it i've made those classes 2 days it does increase the cost just a little bit but that second day is nothing but scenarios. The first day is all practical exercises, information, learning how to properly use light techniques. Uh, and then day two, you go in and just get run through scenario after scenario after scenario after scenario, and you get to use those skills that you've been instructed in, plus the skills that you bring to the class. Right. Uh, nobody comes to me as a blank slate. People come with their own knowledge and own abilities and techniques. Uh, and you take that into day two, and you get to work through a number of scenarios that I try to, as closely as possible, tailor them to your everyday life. So if you tell me, like, hey, you know, I live in an apartment, we're going to build as much of that interior stuff around your floor plan as we can, at least size-wise. Mm -hmm. You know, if some guy tells me, like, hey, you know, I work at night, and I walk home, you know, I, I don't drive to work, like, well, we're going we're gonna to work on that. We're going to work on the outside techniques, um, working that into your everyday life. Uh, and the rifle class is pretty modular. You know, you can take a lot of those skills away from it and go and apply them to home defense. Or you could come take the home defense specific class, which is also two days. Um, but that focuses completely on all the tips, techniques, avoidances, dealing with burglary versus home invasion. And um, biggest problem with home defense is got, some guys presuppose a lot of information. So their plan is based on the event happening at a certain time when they're in a certain place, mm -hmm. which isn't very realistic. Right. Yeah, you it, you're never gonna know when you, you know, when you're gonna have to defend yourself. Well, it's the biggest thing I see is is it doesn't. And most of the people who come to class don't have that, but some do. And I've had guys. Well, you know, I keep the gun by the bed. I'm like, okay, well, where's the gun at two in the afternoon when you're washing dishes in the kitchen? Yeah. yeah. Now we have an issue. When you're mowing your your lawn, you're out mowing your lawn. Exactly. Yeah. When you're in the shower, where's the gun? You know. And people are like, oh, well, that's getting into paranoia. And I'm like, whoa, we're talking about home defense. Like, what, what point do we draw this arbitrary paranoia line? Like, exactly. Is it paranoid to take your gun in the bathroom with you? I don't think so. Yeah. I mean, you're not going to think it's paranoid at all if something happens and you're like, oh, look, I have my gun with me. Now, do you, do you video any of your classes? I try to. Uh, the biggest problem is it's hard to teach and run cameras at the same time. So if I have someone available who's, like, willing to come out and film a class, I do. So I have... I have video of some of my classes on the YouTube channel. Okay. Uh, the most recent class I filmed was my vehicle self-defense class. I got a bunch of video of that up there. Um, now, obviously, it's not the whole class because I'm not going to film an eight-hour class, and no one's going to watch an eight-hour film of a class. Well, there's – You never know. Now, come on. <laughs> that, that's a lot. I mean, that would take four days to upload. There, there are some guys that would do that. Do you have DVDs in your classes I did, I did. or training? I have one DVD that existed. I, it's no longer sold. Um, it was a video of the defense of handgun fundamentals. The biggest problem with DVDs, and I, I was kind of hesitant to do one to begin with, is it's not, it, it becomes an issue of if this is going to be considered canon or not, which is, I mean, is the stuff in this DVD never changing? I mean, some things are. Right. There are some techniques that are always going to be the same until technology changes. You know, Until sights change, we're always going to do sight alignment pretty much the same way. Mm -hmm. uh, until triggers become something different, same things like that. But there are different things that I used to teach that I've gotten away from teaching now based on just – my own personal experience, my own personal education situations, talking to students, seeing what really happens, what doesn't happen, and things like that. The th great thing about the YouTube is if, if my content changes or I, my teaching method changes to a certain degree, I can film a new video and be like, hey, I know I've talked about this before, but here's your new information. Mm -hmm. And it's DVDs, instant. The DVDs, it's much harder because I already have a DVD that's out there, and how am I going to get someone to buy the second one? Right. And I filmed an actual class for the DVD, which was – aggravating to the film guys because I wouldn't allow them to stop and get the second shot. It's like, no, we're not, I'm teaching right now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I was told after, hey, you should have just had nine or ten of your friends and peers come out and act like students and film it that way. I'm like, well, 
Well, I mean, from an instructional point of view, that makes a lot of sense, but yeah, it, seemed, it would seem like almost like cheating. I don't know. I made. I, I, but that's the thing about DVDs is you want the DVD to be spot on. Exactly, and that's why you know basically bringing in ringers, so to speak, makes a lot of sense. So if I film another one, um, that's probably the system I'll use. So it's you know it's exactly cool. what you want. Uh, I'd probably I'm, film a. I'm volunteering to be a ringer. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, film a. I might do a defensive rifle fundamental, but like you're saying. And honestly, I would probably film it just for digital download because the physical DVDs themselves, mm -hmm. people like them, but most people just download stuff these days. Exactly. It would make it Streaming. For me to, you know, after four or five years, I could just throw it up for free on YouTube. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. So you do about, you were telling me you do about a video a day. Is that correct? No, I do one a week. I one a week. Nuts. Well, I, I mean, to, to do the content, you're probably videoing. Probably every day, right? Just about well, every day. I film. I depending on what I'm talking about and what I'm doing. Uh, I try to I try to go to the range, spend about eight hours on the range, and usually, depending on what I'm doing, I can knock out one or two videos. Um, lately, I've been doing a lot of rifle reviews and optics reviews, which suck up way more time. So I'm right. able to get one filming session done, and I'll go back down to the range and actually finish it off. So two range trips would equal one 14, 15 minute instant or not Instagram, but YouTube video. Uh, last week I had a, or actually the video that went up on Tuesday was about the TI training system. Next week is a part two to the Grey Ghost Precision Spectra Light Rifle review. Um, put another two thousand rounds for that thing, four thousand rounds total for the review. Um, oh. Yeah, I, I I got tired of shooting there for a minute. So tell tell me about that. Tell a little bit more about that video. Well, what, what you're doing in that video came out. The first review came out last. week. They sent me the rifle out, and my, my standard is 2,000 rounds. I put 2,000 rounds through any firearm I review. Mm -hmm. So I fired the 2,000 rounds. It's a great rifle, but it did have a problem. It had which, a, which rifle is it? Tell us again which rifle. The Grey Ghost Precision Spectre Light. Okay, and what it what is it? They have this minor issue with their charging handle. They have a proprietary charging handle. And it's, it's an ambidextrous handle, and the way the handle is designed is there's no movable latch. It has basically the, the hook catch has an internal spring so when you apply enough pressure to the t-handle it releases well the spring either was defective or it was just a you know wasn't a strong enough spring or whatever the situation was so during fire that handle would reciprocate occasionally with the bolt carrier group, mm. which is not a big deal but it's something that shouldn't happen right i identified that in the first review and grego said hey we're going to send you out a new handle we're going to send you out 2,000 rounds for our ammunition we'd like you to you know take another look at it so i basically redid the entire review you know part two um, right so now that, you know, it was cool because I took this, you know, I didn't clean it after the first 2000. So the rifle had a total, you know, 4,000 rounds fired at the end of the review process. Um, and one of the most telling things about it is it went 4,000 rounds without a single malfunction, which I, doesn't surprise me, but it might surprise some people who still believe the AR unreliability myth from the 60s. Yeah. Well, that's the thing with technology. The ARs have evolved uh, manufacturing techniques you don't really see bad ars anymore unless they're budget ars to begin with yeah yeah or you build one yourself you know what you're doing <laughs> yeah that could, that could be a, that could be a thing i've yeah. seen that before that's not me though that's not me you know? I functioned on the first magazine and were broken and... yeah well that'll that'll lead us into um our next segment and uh our new sponsor the sonoran desert institute uh, is sponsoring this segment and Zeke introduce it for us. SDI is proud to present the talking lead. Fact 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 fight 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 the myth. Myth. All right, guys. So we, we welcome the Snoring desert Institute as one of our, our main sponsors now and, uh, couldn't be a better segment for them is the facts to fight the myth. And this week we've got, uh, a new one, a pretty good one that Aaron is going to tell you about now. All right. So as he stretches, <laughs> Yeah. well, this is it. I'm trying to, I, I want people to be able to visualize what I'm talking about because I can't hold the gun up to the radio so they can see it. So what you have is what's commonly known as the double feed on the hand. Um, the round in the chamber, live round or spent round, whatever it is, fails to extract. And then the slide comes forward and attempts to load another round from the magazine into the chamber, which is impossible because two objects can't occupy the same space, the same space at the same time. So you have what's commonly referred to as a double. Feed. Now, it's been taught since I don't forever how to clear it. 
uh, is a five or six step method, depending on who's teaching it. And the, the method is lock the slide to the rear, remove the magazine, rack the slide like once, twice, three, five, ten, fifteen times, however many, reinsert the magazine, rack, and then reassess and fire if necessary. Uh, the problem is that's there's a lot of steps in there you don't actually need to perform. Um, if you think about what the problem is, the biggest issue is can you strip the magazine without locking the slide to the rear? And the answer is yes, you can. Uh, there's not a lot of guns out there. I've yet to encounter one that you cannot consistently strip that magazine without first locking the slide to the rear. So we've already eliminated one step. So let's just get rid of that step altogether. And of course, trust but verify. Check it on your own gun to make sure it works. At this point, do I need to rack the slide four, five, 10, 15 times, three times, two times? Do I need to rack it at all? Can I just then reinsert that same magazine or reinsert a new magazine if I don't trust that magazine for some reason, then rack the slide, then reassess? Because if the extractor is broken, no amount of racking is going to clear that chamber. Right. So if I reinsert the magazine and the extractor is functioning, it's going to clear the chamber and it's going to load a good round and I can reassess my threat. So I've taken a five or six step process down to three or four. Right. And it definitely cuts down on the time needed to clear the malfunction. Uh, I've been in a gunfight. Time is of the essence. Well, time is life, man. Uh, yeah. The more time you have available to you, the more chance, you know, the, the greater your chances for, for winning a gunfight. Um, and again, a uh, double feed is lower. It's less likely than some other issues to, to arise during a, a self defense situation, but we need to train and practice it because it can happen since it can happen. Uh, we need to be as quick uh, and as efficient as we possibly can be. So I've been teaching that method for quite some time now, and I've officially adopted it into my training curriculum, and uh, I've yet to see it not work. Uh, and I, I'm i able to induce real, live, honest-to-God double feeds in classes um, with a with uh, a malfunction stick on the handgun. Um, so it's a full-power double feed, and guys are being able to clear it with the method I teach. And I'm not the only one who teaches it. There's a lot of guys out there that teach this too, but – yeah. If you Google how to it makes sense. what you're probably going to get is the five or the six steps. It's a waste. There's so many steps in there. It's, it's pointless. You can, you can definitely uh, get it done a lot faster, a lot easier. Right. Efficiency, efficiency. That's key. Yes, sir. Well, good. That's a good one. We haven't, we haven't anything had anything any, anywhere near that before. So that's a good fact to fight the myth, Aaron. Appreciate that. Yeah, no problem. All right. So last week we're going to get to uh, the trivia now. And last week, our question was, and we had uh, we had Zeke and we had Rob Pincus on, and the trivia question was related to a video um, that Rob did. It was a PDN tour update video. He was in Oregon at the J-Rock Training Center when he was talking with Robert Burns, and you were supposed to name the sponsor that donated a couple of specific items to an LE class, and they had made mention of that uh, somewhere in that video. And our winner this week, well, actually, I'll do our runner-up. Our runner-up uh, was Tom Single. Tom wins the Sonoran Desert Institute T-shirt from Zeke. And our winner was Jerry Black. And Jerry gets two shirts, one from ICE Training and one from PDN. And Jerry answered that the sponsor was Benchmade. Congratulations to those two guys, and sorry for the other people who didn't get their answers in on time, but uh, you got to be quick on the draw, guys. People people listen to the show as soon as we get it out, and they're uh, quickly answering these questions. So I think I may have a different uh, scenario in picking the winner. I may, instead of a time who's first on it, I may just do a random thing from now on that way because I know people get it and listen to it at different times, so to be fair to everybody – uh, from now on, I'm just going to take uh, the pool of people who have at, at the time that I do the show uh, and then just do a potluck random kind of winner thing. So that'll make it fair for everybody. Uh, Jerry has won some things in the past. I know Tom has won some things in, in the past, but I mean, these guys take part. So uh, if you guys want to win something, you got to take part. Jerry Black and Tom Single, congratulations, buddies. So this week's trivia question is obviously going to be related to our guest. And Aaron has a video that uh, is going to relate to this week's trivia question. Tell us about it, Aaron. 
Well, this was, I do a video a week. They come on at Tuesday at 11.30 a.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. That's when they post, and then I promote them after that. But this video is a review video I did on the Trigicon 3x9x40 Variable Mag Optic, their new ActiPoint line. Cool. Or ActiPower, sorry. ActiPower. Uh, in this video, I am wearing a T-shirt. And my trivia question is, who makes that T-shirt? Okay. So, as always, you've got to answer the question, and you have to go to our guest page. Aaron, uh, your Facebook page is Sage Dynamics? Yes, sir. Okay. So, this is going to be a three-step process, is you have to go and like his Facebook page if you aren't already, uh, or if you haven't already, and you have to go to his YouTube channel, and you have to subscribe to his YouTube channel also. Uh, in order to getting the question right... And we will verify this. If you've not subscribed, if you've not liked his Facebook page, um, then you just by answering, you don't get it right. You've got to do all three of those things. Good luck with that. And what's the prize going to be, Aaron? Yeah, I'll put up a handgun class. What are you putting up? A handgun class. A uh, guy who wins gets it right. No way. Free handgun. Yeah, free handgun class. Okay, everybody's, everybody's disqualified. I win. So <laughs> Con contest over. <laughs> no, that's phenomenal, man. Appreciate yeah, that. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll mail them out a certificate, and then they just need to contact me when there's a hanging class on the uh, schedule they want to go to, and uh, they'll get in. That's f***ing awesome. So there's there's you some motivation there, guys. Um, and what better time for me to change the rules of the, the contest, too. So everybody's going to have a fair shot at winning that handgun class from Sage Dynamics. Very cool. Aaron, a few shows back, we were talking about a video that you did. It was called Eat Your Own. Yes. Uh, let's just talk high level a little bit. I mean, we talked about it before in the show, but again, that video resonated with me because I see it happening a lot. And you know, I've, I've probably done it to, to a certain extent myself, but since that video, I mean, I've really tried to keep my mind open and be less critical of another person's rig that they're running, their gun, you know, whatever it may be. So tell us a little bit about how, how you came about making that video. Well, it, it all started with a conversation, and it, it's a feeling I've had for a while, but I, I was motivated to make the video uh, based on a conversation, uh, actually a couple conversations. There are a few conversations that really brought it out of me. Someone was commenting on, I believe it was, it was either Instagram or Facebook, um, about someone's, someone's kit. And they were making comments that didn't really have a contextual basis to them. They're just saying, well, I wouldn't do that. You shouldn't do that. That shouldn't be how you do that. I wouldn't spend that much money on a handgun. I wouldn't do this. I wouldn't do that. And my feeling is why, okay, if you feel that way, then that's fine. Like, I don't get it, but okay. But why do you feel the need to actually talk about it in the public space? Like, your opinion is suddenly going to change all these people's minds to what end? Like, if you don't like something, don't do it. That's pretty much how it works. Like there's certain types of foods I, I don't like to eat, so I don't eat them. Like, and that's it. That's the end of it. Right. Um, RMRs have become really popular on handguns um, for a number of there, – there's some, some definite benefits to the system. But people are like, oh, I'd never spend that kind of money on a, on a, on a, on a gun. I'd never have that done to my gun. So don't. Yeah. Uh, it's that simple. But don't suppose that based on your experience, that your experience is collectively shared with all these other shooters, there are levels of skill. And a lot of people don't, especially when we get involved in Internet conversations, a lot of people don't realize that there are identifiable level of skills. And anytime somebody says, well, I've been doing this longer than you, they're assumed to be arrogant. No, it could be actually a fact. So someone factually says, look, man, I've been shooting professionally. For 10 years. That's a fact. That can be a fact. But someone says, well, you know what? I own guns. That's not the same thing. And there's right. a medical term for it, a psychological term for it. It's called the Dunning-Kruger effect. When someone has a bias where they believe that they have an – it's almost like an illusionary superiority because they believe that their skill level is just as high as that person's skill level because they know about the same thing. So mm -hmm. if I know an RMR exists, and this guy knows an RMR exists, and we both know that they can go on handguns. Suddenly, we both have the same level of experience with that system, which is completely false. Right. Now, can it happen? Yes, absolutely. Two people can't have like experience levels. Um, but just because you know something exists doesn't mean you know why it's used, how it's used, and what benefits it provides. But everybody's going to have a different experience. Yeah, everybody's going to have an opinion. 
with it. You know, you might have 10 years experience with it and he might have 10 years experience with it, but your experiences are going to be completely different. Exactly. And, yeah. and we are, then we get back into context. What in, in what context was his experience gained? If he's a competition shooter, if he shoots IDPA or IPSC or, or, you know, whatever, his experiences are probably going to be different than someone who carries it professionally in like a law enforcement setting or self defense setting or, or teaches with it or, you know, or just hobby shoots. Like everybody's experience levels are different. 10 years just means you've been doing something for 10 years. It doesn't really define exactly what you've been doing. And right. if you've been doing something wrong for 10 years, then that's not really correct experience. Yeah. And in, in, in the firearms industry, it's really easy for people to assume they know just as much as someone who's identified as an expert by a large majority of people. So you take any instructor. Now, I would never call myself an expert. That's that's up to other people to decide. If someone wants to call me an expert, that's their decision. They may feel like this guy seems like an expert. I'll never call myself an expert, but I know just me in my own knowledge of how long I've been doing this, I do know more than other people. Not everybody. By no stretch of the imagination do I know more than other instructors. I know all kinds of instructors who know, who know way more than I do. Yeah. But there are, you know, a guy who literally just turned 21, got a CCW, bought a handgun. He's never had any formal training. Would you be willing to agree to I know more? Uh, See? Yeah. Right there, people are like, well, yeah, but you're being arrogant. No, I'm not being arrogant. Mm-mm. I'm just being factual. Yeah. People's feelings get hurt so easily that it turns into this argument where guys are willing to gang up on someone who's adding information to a conversation just because he's the most experienced person in the conversation. Yeah. Well, you know, everybody's going to have their their own point of views, and they're going to feel strongly about some things more than they do other things. And you know, I get that. But at the point where somebody is so close minded that they think that they know everything, that they're not willing to listen to take points or take issues with what someone else has to say, the information that they bring into it, then, then you're dealing with, in my opinion, somebody who's irrational. Yeah. You know. It's an emotional argument to a factual question. Yeah. So if your argument begins with I feel instead of I know, mm-hmm. then you've already kind of set the lost the battle. The going to go. Exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and I, I'm all for engaging with people when they have a legitimate question. If somebody says, well, why do you set your sights up like this? Or why do you run your light like that? Or why do you wear this? Or why do you use that kind of gear? That's a that's that's a question. It's an honest discussion question. Right. They obviously they obviously want knowledge. They're wanting knowledge at that point to to either reinforce or to reassess how they are doing things. Yeah. yeah. Um, Where, whereas if they come in and say, you know, you shouldn't do it that way. Yeah. You know, don't don't do that. Well, and I get well, we didn't do it that way in the army, and I'm like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Cool. And when were you? When were you in the army? <laughs> I was in the army too, and I got to be honest, the army taught me just enough to get myself killed. <laughs> Most of the knowledge I've gained was after the military. Now, again, I didn't do career; I wasn't in for twenty years, but I learned enough to know how the military addressed his teaching, and it's lowest common denominator instruction for the majority of people who serve. But you took know. your you took your military, and then you went on. You didn't just quit there. You've done other things too. You're yeah. you're law enforcement also, right? You're you did the I was military, then I was a security contractor, and then I went into law enforcement. Yeah. Uh, and along the way, I took as many classes as I could. Um, yeah. If I had money in the budget, I was trained. It so you come difficult. you come at it from a you come at it from a different perspective than than some people, where you get. Do you get the perspective of the military, the private contractor, the law enforcement? And then now, I mean, you've, you've obviously got the corporate. So you've got all kinds of different angles that you be, that you can form your opinions from. Um, and, and I'm always one to listen to my students because every class I teach, I learn something from a student. A student's going to teach me something. Um, like when I get into, you know, defensive handgun fundamentals, defensive handgun one, I go into, you know, like, what do you do if you're carrying and the person you're with isn't? So we talk about defensive third party. And then I talk about like, hey, you know, most people who carry guns hang out with other people who carry guns. How do you guys, do you guys know how to work together? I'm not talking about clearing rooms and stuff like that necessarily. I'm talking about basic communication and staying out of each other's way. Uh, but then I get into people like, well, you know, I have a three-year-old kid. And I was like, okay, at the time I didn't have anything for but mm-hmm. speaking with all of my alumni that have children, I've developed a lot of techniques based on, you know, having kids that can walk versus having kids you have to carry, strollers, things of that nature, because I personally don't have that experience in my life. But I can rely on my students who are forward-thinking shooters 
who have thought and gained this situation because they've had kids for three, five, ten, fifteen, you know, however long their kid, how old their kids are. That's how long they've had them. They've mm-hmm. been thinking about this stuff. Yeah. So we take what we've gained collective knowledge and apply best practices and come up with a solution that I'm able to teach. But, you know, the first thing I'm going to tell people is, look, I don't have children, but this is collective knowledge from a lot of really good shooters who do have children. And these are some of the best case scenarios we've developed for techniques around having to defend your life while you have your kids with you. All right. Um, and that's, you know, it's a share of knowledge and it's something you don't see a whole lot of on the Internet, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, that and that's good that you do that. Uh, but the fact that you're, you know, listening to your students and their needs, and then you're developing techniques and classes around that is that's huge. That's awesome, man. There are thing in, in firearms instruction is you can approach it from a couple of different ways. But I've I've had lots of really good instructors, and I've had lots of bad instructors. And one thing that always bothers me as a student is when an instructor makes an assumption without even knowing my skill level or my personal life on my performance ability, saying, "Well, you can't do this because of this, or you can't do that because that doesn't happen." And I'm like, where are you getting this information from? So when I look at, you know, when I deal with my students, the student is going to come to me, and within the first 15 to 20 minutes, he's going to tell me what he needs. I don't get to decide what he needs. He tells me what he needs, and that's what I teach Yeah. within the tempo of the class. So if a student has a three-year-old child, I'm going to focus on slightly different techniques for him. He needs to focus more on one-handed shooting. He needs to focus more on moving. He needs to focus more on verbal commands and disengaging from a situation. Then he does being aggressive, driving the gun, moving forward on the threat, things like that. Because his context and his lifestyle choices and lifestyle needs are completely different from a guy who's a 22-year-old single and he doesn't, you know, doesn't have to deal with anything or police officer or something like that. So the right. student tells me what they need. It's my job. Now. Very cool. Great show, man. I appreciate you being on again. I know that um, I've added some questions since the first time you were on. Okay. And I want to ask this one to you. And it is if you could spend the day at the range with anyone, fictional or real, and it could be a group of people, one individual, who would that be? Well, it's two guys, but they work together, so they come with a package. Okay. Sykes and Fairburn. Sykes and Fairburn. Tell me who they that is. Are, depending on who you ask, they're considered the, the grandfathers of the modern shooting technique. What we know as Ford Isosceles is something these guys were teaching in the late 20s, early 30s. Uh, they were both police officers in Shanghai, China. Um, and at that time in China, they had running gun battles every single day. They had officers die every single day. Uh, and they developed modern and intuitive shooting techniques, which we forgot about and then rediscovered uh, in the late 70s, early 80s when we got started getting away from Weaver and back into what's considered today Isosceles or Ford Isosceles. But for Sykes and Fairburn, it was considered the modern shooting technique and they based it on just intuitive psychology and intuitive physiology for the way that people naturally fought. Hmm. Uh, Blading your body is unnatural. Um, So they basically developed their, their teaching regimen around um, facing your threat, shooting with both arms extended, things of that nature. Uh, They did a lot of one handed shooting as well and use cover and things like that. But the, the sad thing about it is a lot of what they taught hasn't been carried forward uh, as well as as it should have been because they just didn't have instruction wasn't a thing like it is today so back then it you like how do you find out about these guys where do you go to train with them like the internet didn't exist you know telephones mm-hmm. largely didn't exist um, newspapers were pretty much all you had you didn't have guns and ammo now you said these guys are in China is that right they, well yeah they were they were in China but they passed on a lot of that ne- uh, knowledge to uh, Rex Applegate and then Applegate trained a lot of guys and to my knowledge, there's only one student left alive. A lot of these guys have just, you know, died of natural causes. They're, you know, mm-hmm. they're getting up there in age and passing away. Uh, there's one guy left in Ohio that's still teaching the same stuff that Sykes and Fairburn taught. Um, and it's amazing to me to see what was developed in the 1920s and 30s, largely around the revolver. Uh, and if you compare it to some modern techniques that other instructors are teaching, maybe without any knowledge of Sykes and Fairburn ever exist, it's the same stuff. Huh. Um, but yeah, if I could, I'd, Very cool. I'd, I'd hang out with those dudes all day. How did you hear about those guys? Uh, I, I doing research. I know you're a scholar and you do a lot of reading and you, you know, you're very, uh, well, very scholar. I first heard about them in a, in a book I was reading. Uh, it was a fiction book. They made mention of Sykes and Fairburn and they talked about the Sykes Fairburn dagger. And these guys did a lot of training for OSS and stuff like that during World War II. 
so I started looking into it myself. I read a book called Shooting to Live, which came out, in, I believe, in the early 30s. And I read that book. I still have my copy of it. It's not not a big book, but it's an awesome read. It's got diagrams and stuff like that in there, too. Right. Um, but I was doing research on an article about the modern fighting technique, the way people square to the threat, like basically Weaver versus isosceles kind of thing. I published that on Recoil Web about three years ago. So if you Google uh, shooting technique in my name, it'll probably come up. Cool. But I rediscovered them in writing that article because I wanted to find it. I wanted to go as far back as I could and figure out where the modern technique came from. And it goes all the way back to archery. Yeah, well, the, when firearms became a thing, people said, well, how do we train you? Like, well, archery is close to that, right? And there's a lot of misconceptions that come from archery, too. Like, people, the bullseye came from archery. But the bullseye mm -hmm. was originally 10, 15 feet in circumference, and it was designed as an artillery target. So mm -hmm. a column of archers would all try to put their arrows in that 15-foot circle. But when they were training on individual-to-individual individual combat, they shot three-dimensional straw dummies that were usually mounted on lame horses. Or they were tacked up to a tree, or, they, or however the situation was, they were shooting arrows into real people when they're talking about, or not real people, but straw dummies. Yeah. They were talking about individual combat. When they talk about artillery fire, longbows and things like that, they would use the big bullseye starters. Yeah. And that was a cool one. Well, I always love having you on the show because I always, I always come away with some new knowledge, and it's awesome. So, Lead Heads, it brings us to the end of a, another episode of Talking Lead. Aaron, man, so great to have you on. Um, looking forward to, I promise I'm going to get down there, man. I promise I'm, I'm going to come down and uh, I'm going to take, take some classes with you. Uh, my brother has recently moved down there now. So, oh, cool. So, I've got a place to stay and, and, and whatnot. So, I could spend some, some good quality time down there. Tell everybody what uh, what you got coming up and how they can get in touch with you and all that good stuff. My next class in the Atlanta area is Defensive Handgun Fundamentals and Defensive Handgun 1, which are on the uh, 29th and 30th of August here in Atlanta. Okay. Coming up on the 8th and 9th of August in Wichita, Kansas, I'm teaching my Force Focus Fundamentals, which is Simunitions and Defensive Handgun 1 the very next day. That's the 8th and 9th. Um, September, I've got, uh, I'll be doing defensive rifle fundamentals in Texas. I'll be doing a weapon retention class in Atlanta. And then I'll be doing a vehicle defense class, live fire vehicle class here in Atlanta as well. Uh, partnering up with Paul Van Dunk in October to teach up there in Great Meadows, New Jersey, which is the 3rd and 4th of October. And then the 10th and 11th of October, I'll be teaching at OK Corral in Okeechobee, Florida. If anybody wants to uh, you know, check out a class, they can uh, check out the Instagram or the Facebook or the website and get linked to the calendar and see where all the classes are going down. But uh, my schedule is pretty cool. I still got a few dates for the rest of the year. I got to fill up and then I'll start filling up uh, for January uh, into 2016. Okay. And then, like you said, you're working on the night vision courses. Yeah, so the, the night vision class. It's the night vision class. Dynamics, Mod Armory. We're partnering with Mod Armory as a company, a night vision company based out of Colorado. Uh, we're partnering up to provide night vision training to those people who don't have night vision. They don't own it themselves and they want to provide it or they want to be able to use it before they make a decision on purchasing or someone who has night vision. Uh, but wants to take class and learn how to really get the most out of the system. Uh, so luckily I have Mod Armory on my side helping me out with that. And, uh, yeah, the thing awesome. about it, like I said, is you don't have to bring your own night vision. You don't have to own it. You can come out, we're going to give it to you. We're going to get you a, a laser, you know, an IR laser, either a PEC or a, a D-ball for your rifle. Get it zero, get it set up. You're going to go through the class and come back with a lot of knowledge. Sweet. I definitely would like to get in on that. Uh, maybe I could be, like, one of the first to take it. Hey, that could happen. Um, it'll probably be an Atlanta area or a southeast area class the first time I run it. We'll okay. See. Cool. Yeah, that'll be awesome. Now, and if they wanted to buy their night vision, can they go to Mod Armory and buy? You can, you can buy whatever you want. Mod Armory carries everything. Cool. And they have a really cool liquidation section. So if you're looking, at, you, you, you know, you want to get a deal on, on uh, you know, something that's been used, but still. Oh, man, let me tell you, Leadheads were all about a good deal. So. Yeah, they, uh, <laughs> they, they have quite a bit of things in their liquidation section. Speaking of, you've got a, a an online store too, right, where you sell some... Some well, kit and gear? 
Um, now I just do t-shirts and I do them through Teespring just because I, I just don't have time for fulfillment on my end, packing shirts and envelopes. Okay. Like Tell people how they can get your t-shirts. Uh, it's uh, basically if you follow me on Instagram, uh, at Sage Dynamics, or you follow me on Facebook, facebook.com backslash Sage Dynamics, I'll post. All my shirts are limited runs, so if you want a design, you have to catch it when it's available or wait for it to come back. Because uh, I don't cool. maintain constant uh, sale so some designs you won't see them again for eight months and they usually offer them again the next time in a different color or a different font or a different style artwork or something like that yeah. so as always lead heads keep your loved ones close and your firearms closer or your night vision and your or night, your night vision. or your and, desire to train or your night and your flashlight and your <laughs> shotguns and your girlfriend and 